Thank you all for coming. It's, a, it's really, really great to finally see people in person when I give a talk. So um, feel free to make facial expressions based on how much you like or don't like what I say. And uh, today I will be talking about edge computing because everybody does these days one way or the other. And I will also introduce you a really cool open source project that I'm actually the community manager of. So hopefully you will like what I have to say today. Uh, when it comes to me, uh, my name is Ildiko Vancha. Um, I work as senior manager of community and ecosystem at the Open Infrastructure Foundation. Um, you can also find my email address on the slide, so if you want to catch me and you don't have time after the talk, then feel free to drop me an email and have a follow-up conversation about uh, the topics that I go through today. And as I said, edge computing um, is the main topic of this talk, um, and I will not go into detailing what edge is. I don't believe in uh, that exercise anymore. However, I would really be interested in figuring out what you all's interest in edge is. Um, is there anyone here who has any edge production deployments running? Awesome. Um, who is here who is looking for like a platform and the components to put together your edge solution and deploy? Not that many. Um, OK. Um, so you all just want to learn about what's in this space, what's new, what's exciting. OK. Sounds great. Then uh, let's dive into it. And let me start with the boring telco and 5G use case. So um, I wanted to bring this up because when it comes to edge computing, the edge part of it really highly depends on what your use case is, what role you, uh, you have in that use case. You're like delivering one part of it. You're the, you're the organization who has their business depending on, on that use case. So edge really means really different things to different people and different organizations. However, when you take like a high level bird's eye view on edge, you will see that there are a lot of uh, similarities between use cases as well as, again, what you need and what you're looking for, the challenges that we all uh, need to overcome. So telecommunications and 5G, uh, even though it's not necessarily uh, straightly an edge use case, uh, in some extent it is, um, it is an industry segment that really is pioneering this, uh, this space because when it comes to edge, one thing that I believe we probably will all agree on hopefully, fingers crossed, that edge is on the edge of something, which is usually the network. And someone has to provide that network. Someone has to provide that connectivity. So uh, when it comes to uh, the telecom operators, there really is a big pressure on them, on one hand, to evolve their business and provide you know, new services, functionality, uh, more excitement to their users, as well as to provide the connectivity for everybody else to be able to run their edge use case as well. So uh, this is why this one is so much in the spotlight. And, um, since telecommunication is a highly regulated um, industry, they also have a lot of strict requirements. So when it comes to anything from real time, latency, bandwidth, they really are um, uh, under high pressure to, uh, to deliver on their um, SLEs and other requirements. And uh, the other thing with telcos um, is that most of them are running infrastructure on a massive scale. It's also massively geographically distributed scale. So when it comes to uh, challenges like deploying that infrastructure, that is already really, really hard. And that's when the real excitement starts, which means, so I have it up and running. What now beyond not touching it ever again because it currently works? So the day two operations, as they call them, is something that is a big challenge for telcos. And as more and more edge use cases are getting rolled out in production, it's not just a telco challenge anymore. Like, how do you orchestrate, manage, and maintain a massively geographically distributed infrastructure that is not necessarily a solved challenge yet? And um, when it comes to edge computing and industry segments, uh, what you can also um, see, again, depending on where you are, 
um, that there are a couple of industry segments that, that are getting more into uh, the digitalized era and uh, also starting to rely highly on cloud, rely highly on cloud concepts and taking those out to the edge, whatever the edge means to them. So um, we looked into you know, large telecom deployments, the cell tower is on the top of the mountain and at the same time you can um, look uh, with the same mindset, look at a factory floor, the large machinery and also the small industrial PCs uh, sitting sometimes ne next to the large machines. Uh, they also have highly uh, regulated parts of their operation, uh, human safety is even on the line when it comes to uh, factory floors. So all the, all the real-time real capabilities um, have to be there to avoid any accidents to happen and at the same time obviously they are trying to uh, make the production as efficient as possible and as automated as possible. So uh, again, they are facing similar challenges than what the telco deployment does. However, the whole look of it is completely different. And another area that I like to bring up um, is uh, agriculture and aquaculture. Um, I'm co-leading a working group called Open Infra Edge Computing Group and we do have two white papers and this is one of the use cases that we highlighted in our second white paper and it is really interesting like how you automate a shrimp farm. Uh, it is actually coming from China and how they are using uh, AI and machine learning and, and how these ponds are turning into digital infrastructure um, and again um, similar challenges as some of the previous one in terms of you have to be able to constantly monitor the environment and react if something happens, whether that's uh, environmental circumstances or there's somebody uh, like an intruder breaking into the place and trying to do damage. Um, so uh, for those, you really have to be able to run the workloads efficiently, uh, react in real time to make sure that the uh, that the animals are safe at all times as well as the humans who are still working there and uh, utilizing same and similar concepts like um, hardware acceleration and uh, trying to utilize your resources that are available uh, as highly as you can uh, to be able to run the machine learning and the other new algorithms that uh, were not known to this industry segment just a few years ago. Um, so. A little bit of summarizing um, what I just rambled about in the past five minutes or so. Um, one thing that I think will be easy to agree on is that all these systems grow large uh, in their respective area and it always ends up in complexity. These are also usually large and organically growing systems. So again, we always try to eliminate complexity. Uh, and in my personal, personal opinion, we really are starting to get to the point where we just all have to accept that complexity is something that will always stay with us. So we need to figure out how to handle it, how to uh, evolve in areas like orchestration, automation, and how to just live together with complexity because we will not be able to run these large scale systems in any simple way. And this is where, again, automation uh, will be a big part of the rest of the presentation. And um, I will also uh, today be focusing on the infrastructure bits and pieces, like uh, how it looks like and how you can start uh, dealing with these kind of challenges that, that I mentioned, like um, just a simple thing. There's a small bug in one of the software components that you just deployed on, I don't know, tens of thousands of edge sites. So how do you fix that? You will probably not send out a human to every single site to install a patch from a USB drive. Uh, or if you do, that will be, well, a really long process that will cost a lot of money. So how do we deal with all these things? And the other, the other angle that I like to always remind people of that you always have architectural choices. 
And um, one part that I really like being in an open source environment uh, is that I get to talk to people about what their use case is, what scenario works for them the best. Uh, when it comes to the edge computing details, there's always a big conundrum in terms of, do I want one central place where I run the whole massive uh, infrastructure from, all the control services are there, and on the edge, I just worry about my workloads and I don't care about any anything else, um, it's much easier to orchestrate and manage. But what happens when I lose connectivity between the central side and the edge, uh, for instance, like will the edge just start operating? Will the workloads still be running? Um, so those are, those are the, uh, the pain points of that architecture option. Or the more popular one on the uh, right side of you. Um, is the one where you have control services running all over the place just to really make sure that the edge has autonomy. And again, the edges are always different. So in some use cases, uh, the centralized way works well. And, uh, and in other use cases, you want a more decentralized distributed model. Um, so again, never say just edge because it always depends on the context. So um, the solution part. Um, how, how does infrastructure software look like that might be able to handle at least uh, a good chunk of the challenges that, that I just touched on? So um, in the rest of the presentation, I crammed in uh, a lot of information about the Starting X project. Uh, I will not go into details about every single uh, part of those uh, features or technical details. Uh, there are pointers in the slide for documentation um, and also where to reach the community because it is an open source project with a really lively open source community around it. So you will be able to find uh, the experts who are working on different parts of the project if this is something that is interesting to you. So um, what is Starling X? Uh, quick question to wake you all up, hopefully. Um, who heard about Starling X before? Who knows? Awesome, a few of you, but not that many. Um, then I will uh, focus a bit more on the uh, introductory part of um, of the slides. So uh, in a nutshell, Starling X is uh, a package that is an integrated um, open source cloud platform that is fine-tuned and prepared for uh, fulfilling the requirements and challenges of edge and IoT use cases. Uh, what it means in practice, you can, you can see on the, on the diagram on the slide that you probably uh, find a lot of components here that you know, uh, Linux operating system and kernel, I, I probably don't have to intru introduce that one to anyone. Uh, you can see Kubernetes, you can see OpenStack, you can, you can see a lot of components in the orange uh, boxes like uh, Apache, Ceph, uh, Docker, Calico, KVM, all these kind of um, open source components that you're probably already really familiar with. So um, what Starling X does and what the community does is they are integrating together well-known open source components and adding uh, missing functionality to the mix. So what I was talking about regarding complexity and automation and how you uh, manage infrastructure software on a massive scale, um, the components with like the purple um, icons as much as it is visible, um, meaning the color, uh, they are the services that are designed and developed by the community specifically to address the needs and nitty gritties of um, of the edge use cases. So one of the main focus of the project is making it as easy as possible to deploy, manage, and orchestrate the infrastructure services that are integrated together. And um, the other angle of the design and development work is to focus on um, requirements of edge that are things like security, for instance, 
focusing on some of the real-time aspects um, and figuring out, again, how to structure the services within the distributed um, infrastructure. So I will be reflecting back to those two architectural models in a little bit. Um, the project is already running in production in a couple of large uh, telecom companies. I threw a few examples on the slide, like T-Systems, Verizon, Vodafone, KDDI. So if any one of you would be wondering if uh, this one can run on large scale, then you probably already got your answer because those telco companies never joke about scale. Um, so um, how does the, the platform look like in practice? Um, this is a different view of that sort of um, architecture diagram that you can see. Um, there is a central cloud. Uh, which reflects back to my earlier point about the edge is usually on the edge of something, uh, because otherwise we would not call it edge. Um, so what you, what is uh, important on this slide is that um, we all know that edge sites, when it comes to the size and capabilities, can vary a lot. Um, they can be day and night, so sometimes you only have one single server, sometimes you have multiple servers and want to run something in a high availability scenario, sometimes you have like a large or medium edge site, which usually uh, it's often called regional edge or could be called central office if you're in, um, in the telco industry and segment. So. Um, when it comes to the Starling X platform, uh, what's important is that it can run in a hyper-converged mode on a small edge site on one server. You get all storage networking and, and compute function on, on one server. It can run on, on multiple servers in terms of, uh, for instance, implementing some sort of a high availability configuration. And uh, it can also populate, obviously, the central cloud and the, and the large, medium, regional edge site. Um, so you don't have to have multiple uh, projects and software components to be able to deploy um, an edge infrastructure where edge is uh, always heterogeneous. Um, mostly um, at least in configuration options like how many servers you have available but also in the term of like what is available on that particular server and the other interesting part of the uh, of the project is that when it comes to these sites um, on the previous diagram i showed that starling x does have openstack and kubernetes available in it so when it comes to deploying edge uh, you might run OpenStack services on this small edge site, but you might only run containerized workloads with, um, uh, with Kubernetes on the single server small edge site. And again, this is uh, part of one single project that can provide you with those deployment options within one deployment. Um, so the choice really is yours, and you can fine tune the platform to your um, use case. What it means in practice, um, I will not go through uh, on this slide in the details. What the point here is that um, when Starling X integrates uh, those well-known components and well-known APIs, uh, you get the advantage that uh, when you're using the project, you got um, the interfaces that you probably already know. Um, and since these are all open source components, even if you don't know them yet, you have the access to uh, uh, access the code, access the documentation, so it's not just seeing the interface of a black, black box um, environment. So uh, Starting X does give you the traditional uh, deployment options and uh, components of Kubernetes. Uh, you can see that there are multiple options in terms of uh, networking interface, um, hardware acceleration, um, and even container runtimes. Um, I would shamelessly just point to Kata here. Kata Containers is a really cool container runtime project. Uh, again, open source, and if you don't know that one, I suggest you to look into it, but I will not spend time on that one here today. Um, 
the OpenStack deployment, what is interesting in Starling X about deploying OpenStack is uh, that the project deploys the infrastructure services in containers for you. That does not mean that you have to run um, the virtual machine workload in containers that OpenStack runs. It really is just the OpenStack infrastructure services that are running in containers. And why is it good for you? Um, you probably want this uh, type of setup because running the services in containers gives you a lot of flexibility and manageability, so it's much easier to configure the system as well as to, again, roll out some up, uh, updates and, um, and manage the whole environment. So really the secret sauce is that one of the, uh, the popular ways of deploying OpenStack is uh, deploying the services in containers, and that's what you also get with, uh, with Starling X. In the current ongoing 8.0 release uh, cycle, um, the community is working on um, integrating Flux CD from the CNCF ecosystem, so that will be the, uh, the next way of um, deploying um, the containers and put together the, uh, the configuration of the system. And we arrived to um, the distributed cloud architecture uh, functionality, which is one of the kind of the, the flagship features of the project. And this really goes back to uh, the diagram that I showed that had you know, the multiple um, nodes in the deployment. Um, and Starling X, the community chose to implement a distributed cloud architecture. Um, so they chose the distributed option. And uh, they did that because um, the use cases that, that they are preparing the, the project for, uh, most often they really are highly uh, dependent on providing the ability of having autonomy at the edge. So if you lose connection, like the edge site loses connection between the regional or the, the central cloud, you still want well, all functionality, preferably, but at least most of them um, still running. So it's not just have the workload still operating, but also being able to do some user management at the site and uh, spin up a new image uh, or instance um, of one of the services. So you want to have some control over the system, uh, even though you don't have access to, to the central cloud anymore. So uh, the community chose that architecture option and this is how the services and those orchestration functions are also designed within the project. Um, what you also get from this is uh, there's a system controller that runs centrally and you get a single pane of glass view of the system. Um, so there are some more details about that in, on this slide, but what I really want to focus on here is that you have the access to the whole system from the central site, but at the same time, um, there is some built-in kind of um, failover scenario in the sense that you are not 100% reliant on that connectivity at all times between the central cloud and edge. And with that, you obviously get um, the ability of still centrally manage the system, like the monitoring, um, authentication. Um, you get a, uh, the centralized dashboard. So it is, a, it is a really nice functionality, which really is a conceptual choice um, firsthand, and then come the details of how it is actually implemented. Um, I did start my presentation with telecom environments, so what I wanted to do um, is to get back to it a little bit and just see um, like what kind of feedback and information the community received since uh, the project um, got so popular in the, in the, uh, in the telecom space. So um, one thing to highlight is that with the new 5G rollouts uh, and 5G use cases and how 5G sort of reconfigured how a telecom infrastructure looks like, how disag disaggregated it gets, um, 
one of the, uh, the main feedbacks is that the 5G use cases are highly uh, reliant on containers. So when it comes to the part where I told you that you can have only uh, edge sites with only containerized workloads, uh, that first bullet point really uh, points back to that one. Um, and this is where, again, small footprint comes into the picture. So um, with, that, uh, with that configuration option, you can run services on one single server and making sure that your radio unit um, is connected um, to those functions and um, providing full functionality on really, really small footprint. Um, the other um, item that I wanted to mention is the size of, of telco deployments and the scale because we are not talking about tens or hundreds of sites and servers, but we are talking about the range of 50,000. And uh, when it comes to that kind of a range, obviously you have to be able to come up with uh, configuration options and deployment options that can uh, support that kind of a scale with you know, still giving you the view of how the sites look like, what happens, what happens with the alarms, events, and being able to manage the infrastructure in a, in a performant and efficient way. So um, this is one thing that the project supports in terms of um, spinning up the configuration in a, in a way that is um, in line with the scale of a, of a deployment like, uh, like 5G and ORAN deployments. Um, looking into, again, automation and orchestration, uh, the project supports uh, and is looking into continuously evolving in area like zero touch provisioning. And uh, that one is obviously really important at the, the first point here when it comes to like you have to install and deploy those 50,000 deployments. It, it doesn't just happen overnight. Uh, the rollout has to be planned out. And uh, to give you an idea of what it means, uh, if you want to uh, deploy and roll out those 50,000 sites, that means installing 100 subclouds per week. I mean, again, you can, you can send out the person with the USB stick, but you probably don't want to. Um, and even if you do, that's not just one person, and uh, it's just a massive scale. Um, so automation really is key. Um, I, it's, not, it's not my favorite word, but it's definitely a word that I will keep repeating more and more, I believe, in the upcoming years. And um, if you look at the project's website, you will, for instance, see a short demo video about patching on large scale kind of a push of a button and uh, the system rolls out um, uh, a patch to uh, edge sites because you know you might have had a, a small bug that you had to fix. So it really makes a huge difference on large scale whether you're able to manage something efficiently uh, remotely or not. And just small things, uh, the other one, like certificate management. Uh, if you look at, for instance, Kubernetes deployments, this can be something that gives you a lot of headache if, you're, if your system and architecture is not prepared for that. So when it comes to, again, preparing for these um, use cases and how to handle the infrastructure, uh, even these small things are on top of the community's mind to make sure that, that, your, that your system will not break down because you have one single certificate somewhere hidden expired. Because that one is really annoying and sometimes it's really hard to find. Um, so in a bit more, um, let me see how much time I have left. So uh, just a few words about some of the, uh, the new things that, that are coming out um, in the project. So we are currently on the 7.0 release. It's so fresh and new, still hot. The community finished the release process um, end of last week. So we just announced the release yesterday. So uh, I almost feel like I was on the keynote stage. You know, you are the first people knowing firsthand that the 7.0 release is out. Um, 
if you're interested in uh, looking into uh, how the project works, um, I added all the links to where you can find the, uh, the ISO uh, to deploy the software. You can find release notes, project documentation. There is a lot of information about the project uh, on the World Wide Web. So I really do encourage you to uh, go download it, play with it. And most importantly, I will repeat this at least three more times. This is an open source project and an open source community. So um, if you like something, come and tell us. If you don't like something, then really make sure that come and tell us so we can fix it or work with you to figure, figure out why, why you don't like it, why it's not working. The community really wants to know uh, your feedback. And if you want to you know, come and contribute, even better. So uh, key features. Um, there is an ongoing item that I wanted to just throw in here because it's an important piece of information. Um, the community, well, the project has um, Linux operating system uh, integrated into the platform, and it is currently still mainly CentOS, but the community is moving over to Debian. Um, and there is uh, a Debian version with partial functionality available already to try out, and uh, they are currently working on finalizing the migration over to the Debian operating system. At the same time, I did not talk a lot about that, but they are um, integrating the 5.10 kernel, I believe, currently from the Yocto project uh, to provide you with that real-time uh, kernel. So um, when it comes to that part of the project, um, there is some enhancement there as well. They are integrating the um, Horizon project from OpenStack. That's what the, uh, the dashboard is based on. And they are doing some enhancements in that area as well to give you even more options to uh, to fine tune and manage your infrastructure, like even the small things as a firmware upgrade, which is not that small when you have to do that on a, lar on, on a large scale and in a um, heterogeneous environment, because uh, when it comes to the edge, I, I highly doubt that there's any edge environment out there that has every single site equipped with the exact same hardware. Um, or, or if there is, there might be um, you know, one of the miracles of the 21st century, but it's definitely not where we are going in the future. So being able to handle the different hardware devices will be, again, more and more important. And those small things add a lot to your complexity problems when it comes to large scale. Um, and when it comes to yeah, scalability, um, the community is continuously looking into um, increasing the number of subclouds that the that the platform can um, efficiently handle. They are also always looking into um, making just the the simple single operations uh, more efficient and being able to run more and more in parallel, um, which. Probably sounds trivial, but again, when you come to that 50,000 sites and more uh, kind of scale, uh, nothing is straightforward and trivial anymore. Uh, security and, st uh, and stability, um, I don't think that I necessarily have to spend a lot of time on this one in the sense that if you're looking into any edge platform, if they don't have any focus on security, then you should probably look into another one. Because when it comes to the edge um, and having all those little sites deployed everywhere um, in um, most often areas where you don't really have a lot of supervision on them, uh, having enhanced security uh, is really, really cu crucial. Um, the project uh, and the community is currently looking into things like security audit. And uh, since I talked a lot about the telco uh, industry, uh, you can see SNMP support there. Uh, you can blame all the telco operators for that one. But I, I think that it is still um, a really, really important um, piece. And you can also see that they are just doing simple uh, updates, like um, moving over to uh, the uh, pod security admission controller in Kubernetes, which means that they really are putting high focus on uh, staying up to date with uh, um, the developments in the projects that they are integrating and not developing and designing themselves. Um, 
this slide, I just want to highlight PTP, and I did not do a good job with this one. So PTP is Precision Time Protocol. And um, in case you don't know that one, um, it really is all about keeping the clocks in your environment uh, in sync. And it is crucial for 5G for manufacturing and industrial use cases, and honestly, you name it, wherever you need any type of real-time functionality, um, it really does come um, very, very handy. So um, if you have a use case that has some specific requirements like this one, then, uh, then you can find functionality in starting X to cover those. And um, just a quick um, kind of outlook to uh, some of the, uh, the items on the roadmap. Um, I mentioned already the Debian support, so I will not go into, into that one. Kubernetes enhancements, uh, the custom configuration at runtime, that requires a little bit of explanation, so um, I will spend roughly 30 minutes on that one. Uh, what it means is um, it boils down to the complexity part that I talked about. So the community is trying to uh, figure out how to make it a little bit harder for people to shoot themselves in the foot. So I'm not saying that they are limiting a lot of things, but um, like how you can configure some of the components, uh, it has some limitations uh, which applies to, for instance, Kubernetes. So in the 8.0 release, um, you will be able to uh, perform all kinds of uh, configuration changes, uh, runtime as opposed to only at deployment time of the platform, uh, which is on one hand really nice because you have a lot more flexibility. On the other hand, the options are unlimited when it comes to um, infrastructure projects like Kubernetes or OpenStack. So any of you who ever try to operate one of these will know that once you get the free hand of doing whatever you want, that, that's when it gets really dangerous. Um, but you're welcome because, again, more flexibility to you. And hardware acceleration, um, a list of a few new devices that the community is looking into integrating. There are a couple in there already. Uh, so GPUs, FPGAs, and those kind of things you can already run with the platform. Um, and when it comes to Edge, we just can't really stop um, integrating and supporting more and more of those. And again, 5G security, distributed cloud, because I'm running out of time. Um, you will be able to find information about these um, in the community's resources. So I just really want to highlight that all these areas are in focus. Um, and as for security, you will always find some new security features and enhancements in every single release of the platform. Um, getting involved, again, um, open source community. Uh, they have a mailing list. Um, they also have weekly meetings. Uh, you can even find at least me on their Twitter handle if you happen to use it. Um, so. Um, any of the communication channels or ways to get um, in touch with the community. Uh, it is up to you which one you choose. And if you would happen to have any difficulties or questions, you can always find me on my email address that, uh, are, that is also in the slides. And I wanted to give a little bit of a highlight on where you might be able to find people from the community. Uh, one thing that we at the Open Infra Foundation uh, run is a, a live show on Thursdays. It's called Open Infra Live. That is one of the places where you can find all kinds of updates and information about the Open Infra community and happenings. And that includes updates uh, from the Starting X project. I'm really hoping to have an episode up about the uh, 7.0 release and some of the roadmap items uh, sometime this year. Uh, stay tuned for that one. And if you want to still online and virtually meet contributors of the project, we do have a project teams gathering event. Uh, registration is already live. You can find all the information that you need uh, on the link on this slide. It is a contributor focused event. So what we do there is um, the communities get together and they talk about all the nitty gritty details of, uh, of the project that they are working on. Uh, what are the good things? What are the bad things? Uh, what are the big things that, that they need to 
to work on and give high priority to. So if you have any feedback, you would like to meet the people or have any questions, that is a great place to, to meet many, many of the contributors. Uh, this year the event is online um, in October and I'm hoping that next year we will be able to get together in person again. And roughly 59 seconds for questions, if we have any. Yep. Uh, maybe. Oh, well, wait, I think you need the, the microphone first. Thank you. Uh, so one thing I was wondering uh, is if maybe the scope of the Starling X project isn't too, too wide. Like, I always thought of OpenStack as something basically unreachable, whereas com compared, like, Kubernetes seems, e even though it's a huge project still, it, it seems a little tighter in scope. Mm -hmm. And Starling X is basically Kubernetes OpenStack with operators on top with a huge amount of software basically trying to kind of fit in together. Like in different companies for different use cases, it seems almost like as like the, the when you when you reach the end of the the infrastructure, it will already change to something else. Mm -hmm. So, I, like that's kind of my concern. I don't know if it's even a question really. Uh, it just is kind of a trend, I feel like, especially from coming from the OpenStack project. This is how I felt with it. Um, what I would say to that is, I think you're 100% right. And it also goes back to that, you know, the complexity aspect that I, that I mentioned a couple of times. When it comes to Starling X, if you look at it, um, it is still a component, a platform that is on the infrastructure layer. So the community is not looking into the application space, for instance. Um, they are working also with other communities like ONAP in the telco space when it comes to orchestration of, of, the, of the telco environment. Um, so the, the platform itself is not trying to solve everything. What it tries to help you with though is how you integrate those components together. Because that is one of a, a big challenge of, of companies who are just taking Kubernetes and OpenStack themselves and trying to put them together. The, how do I do that? So I have one complex software here, another complex piece of software here. I have an edge use case. And then what? So what Starting X is trying to do is integrate those components together in a sense that, that in a way that makes sense for edge deployments. And those, the, the purple components that, that I showed you, those are practically bits and pieces that are not necessarily fully covered in the open source software ecosystem right now. So they are adding those components to prepare the platform for an edge use case. So it's, it, I, Personally, I don't think that, that it explodes their scope. They are just looking and approaching these infrastructure components and challenges in a different and more integration targeted way. Does that make sense? Yeah, or? I see, see that could help with the, with the issue, definitely. Thanks. We are, I think, two minutes over. Um, I'm happy to chat with any of you, either of you, all of you, uh, once I have the microphone off of me. <laughs> and thank you all for coming.